I'm Rachel, and uh, as Tim said, I'm a research fellow at the University of Sussex, and I've come here to talk about civil society roles in transition. And for a bit of an overview, quickly then, of my talk, um, I'm first going to do a bit of introducing to the topic, um, and just to say now, uh, really, that what's, what kind of motivated me to give this talk, um, to in fact conduct my PhD research, and to write the associated briefing paper, um, is my concern about the ways that civil society and civil society organisations in particular um, are viewed um, by policy and by academics um, and also by funders and by practitioners even within civil society organisations. Um, and I, I guess then my aim um, in, in, this, in this paper and in this talk is to try and shift thinking a bit um, and I hope to do that by presenting a new framework um, that I developed in my PhD research um, that presents, I, I think, a different view. Um, and uh, I'm also going to then talk through some case studies, uh, hopefully to bring the framework a bit to life for you, um, and relate this briefly to some um, food policy uh, issues, um, and then we're going to have a chat about it. So that's what we're hoping to do, and hopefully we'll have a fair bit of time to talk. So why transition? Um, if a picture is worth a thousand words, um, then I hope this is a good choice. <laughs> um, I wanted to share this picture with you because I just came across it on the net the other day and I found it really provocative. And I think um, what I found provocative about it, there's a number of things, um, but it gives me, it, it says to me threat, that nature is under threat, um, and the food system is going to be under threat, and therefore that we, in fact, are under threat given that, um, as Tony just pointed out, we rely on food systems, and food systems rely on nature. So, so there's a sense of threat. And um, there's also a sense in this picture of um, competing utopian and dystopian views of the future um, that kind of feeds into perhaps our keenest hopes and fears about what the future um, the food systems might hold. Oh, sorry. Um, and, uh, but, I, but I also think that uh, the picture kind of suggests a struggle, and not just a struggle, a choice, a choice of which side you want to be on. Um, and therefore, I think that it, it really nicely kind of lays the ground um, for thinking about and talking about the future of, of, of food systems, of more sustainable food systems, of issues around the sustainability of food systems and food security globally. So, I argue in my paper that we're currently experiencing a global search for solutions to uh, sustainability problems in, in, in food systems, and that these calls for transition are coming from um, all different sectors of society, not just from civil society organisations, but also um, from businesses, from governments, from international organisations. And also that these calls have been um, coming for, for a number of years and increasing um, in volume um, and in, and in um, number. So civil society organisations, I guess I should at this point say briefly what my understanding of this concept is. Um, so I follow Patton and others who think about civil society as a distinguishable but inherently open and changeable arena, defined in relation to state and market but always intertwined with them, um, in which people freely form themselves into groups in order to connect around divergent, i.e. different, and sometimes strongly different notions of the public good. Um, and it's a space in which diversity and hybrid forms are generated. So civil society organizations then generally share these kinds of characteristics. They're governed and managed independently of the state. They don't distribute profits to shareholders. They encompass a degree of voluntarism and they exist largely to pursue notions of the public good. So that's a bit of background, a bit of context. So what's going on in the UK? UK-based civil society organisations in food farming. Well, some recent research conducted by the Food Ethics Council revealed that somewhere in the region of three to seven hundred million pounds is spent per year in the UK on activities related to sustainable food and farming by somewhere in the region of 10 to 25,000 CSAs. That same piece of research also revealed that those organisations engage in a wide range of different activities, um, from things that make an immediate difference on the ground at the grassroots level, 
to activities that aim to coordinate and facilitate um, the impacts and the activities of other groups, and those that aim to change the rules of the game. But the report concluded that the focus seems to be on filling holes left in a food system dominated by the private and public sectors ahead of working to influence and change that system. And when we take a little look at the resources commanded by the private sector um, in advertising and also in the, in the value of agro-food systems in the UK and also then a government spending, we can see that the resources wielded by civil society does pale in, by comparison. So that's a bit of context as well, uh, empirical context. So how can we then think about all of this activity um, and how that relates to transition towards more sustainable food systems in the future? So I've been drawing on a theory of transition that's come from innovation studies um, and science and technology studies. Um, and this, this kind of, this, this theory um, relies on a model that has three levels. And some of you might be familiar with this, but for those that aren't, I'll talk through it. This is my own illustrated version. <laughs> um, the middle level then of this model uh, represents the current food regime, um, which is a set of uh, mutually reinforcing policies, patterns of use and demand, um, technologies, market norms, uh, consumer preferences, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the middle level of this model, the current food regime. At the top level then, we have the food landscape, um, which it, it kind of overarches above the food regime and creates the environment in which food regimes can either succeed or fail. Um, so it's at this level that trends and events um, such as food scares, climate change, changes of governments, financial crises and so on um, emerge. Um, and affect the regime. Um, down at the bottom level of the model, we have socio-technical niches. So what this means is, this is the space in which groups of people um, separated, partially separated from the conditions of the regime, the current regime, develop alternatives, alternative innovations, biodynamics, organics, permaculture, food swaps, land sharing, food sovereignty, seed swaps, I could go on and on. Um, and then what this model then suggests is that change from the current food regime to a future food regime, a future more sustainable regime, characterized by social equity, environmental integrity, and personal well-being, which are the characteristics of sustainable development, you can construe them in different ways, um, can come about when there was a, there was a kind of alignment between developments at different levels. So when pressures from the landscape undermine the current food regime so as to open up a window of opportunity for more sustainable innovations to be scaled up to compete with that regime and then form a future more sustainable food regime. So this is the, this is the model that I've been working with. And then my question in my work has been, what roles then are there for civil society within transition from this perspective. So, using this model then, um, I developed my own framework that describes four main roles that civil society organizations play in transition. Grassroots innovation. Civil society organizations in the UK are involved in experimenting with, in, 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 local, in different localities, responding to local conditions and experimenting with different ways of producing, consuming, trading, distributing, and retailing food. And I've come across lots of different examples. Um, there are lots of examples of this going on, from peri-urban farming, urban market gardens, and food growing on urban microsites, growing communities knows all about this, um, biodynamic, or organic, and low-carbon agriculture and horticulture, aquaponics, diversification, growing trials for novel crops, direct marketing, local diet challenges, food, food waste collection, and I, I could go on and on. So, that's grassroots innovation. Niche development. Civil society organizations are involved in developing these uh, alternatives within protected niches so that they can be scaled up and made more accessible to more people. And they do that by developing personnel, by developing the models, the networks, and the infrastructures needed to develop those alternative innovations. And they do that in a wide range of different ways, from providing training in lots of different ways, 
to improving knowledge by commissioning research, collating case studies, coordinating trials, running breeding programs, providing technical assistance, um, how-to guides, establishing networks um, and networking platforms, running events to get people working in the different um, initiatives to meet up with each other and share ideas, um, providing startup funding, and so on. Thirdly, norm challenging. Civil society organisations challenge consumers, policymakers, and businesses to think differently about food systems and about the kinds of food that they buy, where they buy their food from, and the kinds of policies that they're willing to support. And they do this by campaigning and lobbying in a range of different ways, by raising awareness and mobilising people's support through a range of different kind of techniques, um, stunt storytelling, celebrity patronage, Compassionate World Farming knows all about this, um, e-zines and online petitions, um, educating and reskilling people, providing people advice and food outlets, promoting alternatives, generating moralistic pressure, um, opposing, you know, boycotts and, and naming and shaming bad businesses, um, influencing policy makers, hosting policy development platforms, um, building pressure in a range of different ways. Fourthly, regime reform. Civil society organisations are involved in working directly with industries, public institutions and major corporations to help them to translate and embed more sustainable practices and values and patterns of ownership within food systems at scale. And again, they've been doing this through certification and labelling of food products and outlets, supply chains, um, combining and incorporating alternative assessment systems into commercial standards, um, incorporating new criteria within procurement roles for the public sector and at major public events like the London Olympics, um, delivering commissionable service packages for local authorities um, on things like food service, food education, business development and so on, and convening multi-stakeholder platforms to drive dissemination of all of these things um, across industry and across the public sector. Excuse me, I'm giving you a little bit of reference. beyond just characterising these roles, um, is systemic synergies that exist between the roles that civil society organisations are aware of and that they capitalise on. So, grassroots innovation um, is helped and facilitated by niche development. That much is clear. These organisations are working with grassroots projects to help empower them. Norm challenging is helped by grassroots innovation. Um, by, by, by being able to point to grassroots alternatives, this adds credibility um, to campaigns that criticise incumbent food systems. Um, grassroots innovations can also become the seeds of reforms to unsustainable systems. So uh, innovations developed at a local level can be scaled up and then taken um, and, and embedded across um, mainstream food systems. But in order to do so, they often require some translation, um, which is achieved through niche development. Um, or, alternatively, with sustained challenging of norms, actually, um, a space can be opened up for more radical reforming of regimes so that grassroots innovations can be embedded with little translation, with little modification. So these are the ways that these synergies between the roles then can operate. So, Having kind of filtered out these different roles and set up this framework, um, I conducted research um, in the UK and created a case study, really, um, of UK-based civil society organisations working on food and farming. Um, I looked actually at 18 different organisations, um, some of which you will possibly recognise the acronyms up there, um, and, and others you can find in a crib sheet on my paper if you'd like to follow it up. Um, I actually scoped, I, I, um, I kind of sampled this group of organisations by, by initially selecting three organisations, Tablehurst Farm, the Soil Association and the Fife Diet, and then snowballing through their networks. And I actually found that they were all part of one big network, that actually all of these organisations are connected um, 
they, they frequently collaborate and share resources and share ideas in a range of different ways in order um, to kind of increase their collective impacts um, and increase the reach of their campaigns and their work. Um, and I conducted research on these organisations between 2010 and 2013. And what I wanted to know was how then do individual specific organisations perform different roles um, and also particularly thinking about what happens when they collaborate, when they work together, when, when there are different organisations doing different things. How does that look? So I'm just going to talk through a few examples, through the, the, few, through the three that I just mentioned that I looked at in more detail. So Tablehurst um, and Clawhatch Community Farm uh, is a community-owned biodynamic farm based in East Sussex in England. And although its, um, its seeds historically were actually stretched back to the 70s in the village of Forest Row, it was um, first initially established um, or formalised as an organisation um, in the early 90s um, when uh, local residents of the village of Forest Row got together and uh, bought out two farms um, through a community share offer. Um, and now in, uh, in the mid-2000s, Tablehurst and Clawhatch Community Farm um, is home to a wide range of different crops um, and a, a wide range of different um, livestock types that they rear on the farm. They're also on-farm um, processing facilities, on-farm retailing. There are two cafes, uh, two, two farm shops and a cafe. Um, the farm has thick connections with uh, a network of, of different local suppliers where um, it retails its, its produce. It also is home to um, adults with social care needs um, who are employed on the farm and part of the farm community. Um, it uh, trains uh, a host of students, um, apprentices, um, and diploma students studying um, biodynamic uh, horticulture and ag agriculture diplomas, um, and takes um, early career farmers onto the farm and provides them a place um, to, to learn about biodynamic farming so that they can then move on and set up their own farms elsewhere. Um, and, and in that way, to grow the biodynamic um, niche in the UK and in Europe and beyond. Um, Tablehurst and Claw Hatch also hosts uh, spaces on the farm for people in the village to have their own allotments um, and provides a range of events throughout the year to engage the local community so that the farm is really connected um, within the village um, and, and provides a place where people can come and learn about community connected farming if they like. Um, Tablehurst and Claw Hatch doesn't really do norm uh, challenging um, or regime reforming. Partly, this is because um, the kind of Steiner ideals that underpin biodynamic farming that are shared by the core of people who are working on the farm um, don't really chime very well, as they explained to me in interviews, with proselytizing and with going around telling other people what to do. So they prefer people to come to them and see what they're doing and to be the change um, rather than telling people what to do. But if you look at this insect diagram, I don't know if, if this diagram speaks for itself. Is there anyone in here that's totally confused? Feel free to be. No, great. So, so these are all of the different activities I just talked about, and I've just mapped them onto this model. So, so if you look at this insect diagram, then what, can you, what you can see is that the other organisations that Tablehurst and Floor Hatch has relationships with and works with um, are between them kind of covering all of the roles. They've got all the different roles covered. Um, and these are some of the examples of the organisations and, uh, and the, the projects that Tablehurst and Floor Hatch are involved with. So as well as doing all of those things that I mentioned, um, they work with the Biodynamic Land Trust, and with the Biodynamic Association, the Biodynamic College, um, in a coordinated way in order to develop the biodynamic niche. Um, they also work with um, the Soil Association, and uh, the CSA network um, in the UK to help disseminate um, and develop the community supported agriculture model. So you can see here then how Tablehurst and Floor Hatch um, is performing um, multiple roles, these two different roles, and, and, and uh, harnessing the synergies generated by performing these roles. And, and by, by virtue of working in this wider network, um, is able to actually develop an innovation system um, for, for developing 
organic, biodynamic and community supported farming in the UK. So, my next example, the Soil Association that I just mentioned. Um, the Soil Association, as many of you will know, is the UK's largest certification and labelling organisation of organic products. Um, it's also a large organic campaigning charity, which is an interesting conundrum. Um, the Soil Association uh, was, was set up, or kind of started out its life, um, in the post-war period, um, and the kind of things that that, that, that the Soil Association was initially doing were about experimenting with using compost and manures um, in reaction to what they saw as an increasing trend of using agricultural inputs um, and moving away from the use of compost and manures in farming. And they, th they thought that this was de detrimental to the environment and to people's health. So what they then were doing was they were playing a grassroots innovation role um, experimenting locally, recording the experiments, and developing alternative practices. But then in the 60s and 70s, with the back to the land and environmental movements in the UK, um, the Soil Association was instrumental in the growth um, and development of organic labelling systems and certification systems, and the introduction of organic food into a range of um, retail outlets across the country. So they really facilitated then the development of the organic niche in the UK. Moving on to the 80s and 90s, um, the Soil Association moved into norm-challenging mode um, when they really capitalised on a series of food scares um, by pointing out, for instance, that um, on no organic farm in the UK had there been a single outbreak of E. coli or foot and mouth. So they were able then to position organic food as safer, healthier, healthier and more sustainable um, than conventional food in that way. Um, and then moving on again into the 2000s and 2010s, and tens, we can see now that the Soil Association is playing a regime reforming role, working um, in larger collaborations with different kinds of actors, with local authorities, with other civil society organisations, and with food businesses, to um, deliver changes to public procurement um, criteria, uh, and, and to make school food, prison food, hospital food and so on more sustainable. For instance, through their Food for Life partnership um, that they work with uh, a range of other organisations um, and, and the, the different organisations within that partnership themselves are able to adopt different roles within the partnership um, and through the, the Sustainable Food Cities programme and also in playing a role within the Sustains campaign for better hospital food. I'm not sure whether this is an official role but there certainly is um, working um, together in order to deliver the food for life catering mark then within hospitals locally. And my final example then, the Five Diet, which some of you um, may have heard about. Um, the Five Diet is a consumer network based in Fife in Scotland, set up around 2007 by a small group of families that wanted to experiment with, um, use, with consuming only food um, produced within Fife or to be, to be specific, an 80% to 20% uh, ratio of local to non-local food for a year and to eat in season and to eat low carbon um, kinds of food. So, th so this started off as a small local experiment um, and then fast forward to 2012 and 2013, um, the Five Diet had grown to 6,000 members plus, um, having an international media reach. Um, and having been funded by the Scottish Government to undertake a wide range of activities that actually, between them, covered all of these different roles. So the Five Diet has actually been immensely flexible and adaptive um, and developed all different um, kind of act kinds of activities. Um, from kind of consolidating around their creative experiments in food consumption and also food production, um, to um, trying to develop the uh, local food and, and kind of Scottish food movement um, uh, within Fife and beyond, um, to also engaging in a range of, of creative uh, campaigns and stunts to raise awareness and change the way that people think about food, things like the Blaster Festival, um, to actually working then with the Soil Association and the local council to um, help deliver the Food for Life catering mark um, in schools across uh, Fife. Um, and, and, and the seed truck there is an example of um, 
a project that they were working with WWF in partnership on, which was going around Scotland um, in, in the seed truck and actually physically kind of going out and meeting people and, and setting up meetings with local activists and encouraging them to set up community gardening product, projects, to set up community cookery projects, and, and to start organising in their local communities around food. So again, you can see how this organisation um, has, has kind of capitalised on playing all of these different roles and then working with, with other organisations that are also playing these different roles and then developing um, partnerships um, where together they can actually um, start to shift things and create a collective pathway and a collective visions around more sustainable food systems for Scotland. So just to review then um, what I've just said uh, about the research, I've just said that civil society organisations play important roles in transition. That they're adaptive and strategic in combining the roles to achieve their missions. Another side of that story is that they experience a lot of tensions in performing these roles. And unfortunately, that's a story that I've had to cull from this presentation to try and fit into, into 40 minutes. Um, but there's a bit of that in my paper. And again, the, the Soil Association provides a really interesting case study. So just to say, I have had to park that. Um, that they work together to exploit <coughs> synergies between the roles, exchanging ideas and resources. And that over time, <coughs> they've created innovation pathways that have influenced the mainstream. So what does this mean for food policy? Well, at the courtesy of Tim and his wonderful knowledge generated over several decades, um, I'm able to say that in the UK, we've experienced a long history of productionism um, in food policy, coupled with a neoliberal trade policy. And what this has meant then is that in official documentation, in um, national level strategies around uh, sustainable food, um, lead roles are ascribed for central governments, multinational business, and high-tech science. Whereas civil society, well, if they're mentioned at all, if they're not just plainly left out of these strategies, are viewed as a delivery vehicle for top-down agendas, or as a social conscience for a malfeasant food system. But what about then all of these civil society-led initiatives that I've just been talking about? Well, where they are, uh, where they are engaged um, through funding programmes, and where they are evaluated, and where, where they are thought about in terms of this high-tech um, vision of, of, of sustainable intensification, that, that I think there is an inappropriate focus on the quantity of food of improved sustainability credentials that CSOs are involved in producing, at which point people say, who cares about all of this marginal stuff? You know, it's so small and tiny. Uh, it's not going to feed the country, we're not going to feed the world. That's not the point. That, that benighs an ignorance of the other important factors, not least the wider benefits of ethical food consumption and civic involvement in food systems and social activism. There are lots of documented benefits of that, but also of the different forms of systemic innovation through which civil society organisations influence food provision, and that's what I've been talking about today. So. And this is my last slide. Um, I've come up with a, a short list of food policy asks then. And I, I frame this as kind of what if. So what if food policy viewed civil society as a source, incubator, champion, and translator of innovations, rather than treating CSOs as irrelevant, expedient delivery partners, or just troublesome? What if food policy judged civil society organisations in terms of their collective contributions to system innovation rather than focusing on volumes of food produced? What if food policy recognised the mutually reinforcing nature of the different roles that CSOs play in transitions to sustainability rather than just wanting to back the grassroots, which is something that we've seen recently? What if food policy acknowledge the need to support a diversity of approaches rather than looking to focus on just one or the other. And what would this look like in practice? And I think that this opens up a range of questions then um, about how civil society organisations um, are currently evaluated by policy, um, how, their, how, how funding for civil society is administered by policy and by funders, obviously, 
how civil society organisations are regulated, how they're engaged within policy development processes, how they're framed within policy debates, and which other ways they might be supported by policy. And that's what I want to leave you all with um, in finishing my talk. So thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant, wonderful. Um, and I hate being with nitpick about you know, theoretical frames. Yeah. But if I could just say that I find it easier to see civil society as everyone at breakfast time. Yeah. And the CSOs as a separate one of three things which you identify. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, you don't get you know, everyone, the consumers who have the relationship with the dot coms yes. and the consumer voters who have the relationship with the state. So really, CSOs and <coughs> uh, the dot-com people, the market, and the government all do things to civil society. Yes. And civil society can, if, it, if it's CSOs organize it, it can perhaps vote and also um, <coughs> consume in ways which are good for it and everyone else. Yes. I think it's quite important to see the difference. Otherwise, it, it, people don't understand that they are civil society and WWF is a, an NGO doing a good job. Yes. No, I think that's a really fair and important comment, actually, and, and point to raise. And, and I really agree with you about that. And I guess... Mary Douglas. Mary Douglas, yes. Mary. Yeah, wonderful Mary Douglas. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, perhaps I should be clear that, yes, that my research has looked at organised civil society, at, at, at these groups that, that have emerged within civil society, which doesn't represent the totality of civil society. In the neoliberal world, it's important. <laughs> in the neoliberal world, such as we live in, it's very yes. important because it's the people, individuals and folks that could, in fact, influence influence government and also influence yes and be influenced by government or by civil That's society right. organizations and so on too much agreement and can i ask my question Bob? yes yeah uh actually it's sort of a different what's following on from Chinese right? i struggle with what is civil society I mean, it's yeah. not, well, Tony is, I'm looking at Hannah, who's struggling with this in a different way. Uh, uh, maybe you'll come in. Um, I mean, what I like, let me focus upon yes. your field work. Yes. What I liked is you went out and you asked the NGOs, and you were looking at what they did, and you have got your four roles on what they were doing, and essentially the three that we presented today, they were doing different patterns. Yes. So my question is, do you think there's a pattern yeah. within the current UK food NGO world? Is there a pattern that's going on? Yeah. That's one question. Yeah. Tack on. Outsiders look upon Britain and say, we've got this amazingly rich NGO world. My answer to why that is, mm. is that it's Mrs. Thatcher. Yes. By removing the state in the 80s, yes. it actually nurtured space, policy space yes. for civil society to fill, not just with this innovation role that you highlighted, but the <coughs> social role that you gave us at the end. Yes. I don't know whether you agree with what you think. I think that's a, that's a risky debate to be uh, wading into it without uh, a good uh, grounding in all sorts of parts of history. So I'm going to start with the first question, <laughs> um, which was about patterns um, that might be emerging within civil society, broader patterns, I think, that can maybe that connect the different kind of pathways, if I understand. So I think that, um, yeah, that I think that what, what I think that I've been seeing um, I haven't made a big song and a dance of this within my own work, but what I think I've been seeing is that in the last 10 years that um, a lot of previously rather fragmentary um, uh, kind of strands within the food and farming scene within amongst organised civil society in the UK um, have been increasingly coming together and forming broader alliances um, under the rhetoric of sustainable food. 
Um, and in fact, this was recently all over the Farmers Guardian and other sorts of things that I subscribe to, um, that uh, the Soil Association just recently lost a number of its trustees who were complaining um, that uh, the Soil Association is now downplaying organic, that, uh, that the capital O is, has been lost, and the Soil Association is now just talking about sustainable food and not about organic anymore. Um, and, and the Soil Association is not the only organisation that started to increasingly talk about sustainable food. I think Compassion in World Farming is, is another that has kind of positioned itself increasingly in that way. The Sustain Alliance is another one that has been um, really creating this kind of big tent for sustainable food. Um, but um, what I then think, of, of, or what I think slash hope might happen moving forwards um, is that uh, this, this, this kind of tent might increasingly open its doors to bring um, not just the environmental NGOs that I've focused on. There are probably people in the audience today who've been thinking, oh, what about health and nutrition? What about international development? Because um, organizations that focus on those issues kind of fell outside of my sample. Um, so that's a bit of a shortcoming, um, but it is what it is. So what I hope though, and I, well, I think that that's also that's actually happened because of a, a historic separation um, that NGOs, that the environmental NGOs and the public health NGOs weren't particularly good at talking to each other, and international development NGOs, I think, are even farther off the scene. Um, so I think that certainly that the, the health and environment have increasingly been coming together, partly um, because of the realization um, by public health NGOs um, that you can't really solve the health problems without paying attention to environment because environmental drivers um, are really actually um, kind of causing a lot of health problems on a global level. Um, and also by then the environmental NGOs who realise that the environment is actually a really crap motivator for behaviour change, um, whereas health is much better. People are much keener to do something for their health than they are for the environment. So those things have been coming together. But I think uh, the international development NGOs and, inter and the international development agenda around food and farming is, is well, perhaps, it, perhaps looking at it the wrong way, but the, the, the UK-based NGOs working on food and farming are failing to connect um, convincingly and systematically and coherently with environmental development NGOs. And I hope that that's going to happen increasingly. And I think my food bites um, just now I particularly highlighted a campaign that the World Development Movement have just um, launched, um, which uh, looks at the fact that um, DFID um, have recently committed £600 million worth of UK taxpayers' money to the new alliance um, for nutrition in Africa, um, and pointing out that, um, well, their view of this, to which I am strongly sympathetic, is that the new alliance is essentially yet another way of corporate takeovers of African um, food systems by Syngenta, you know, Monsanto, Unilever, uh, Coca <coughs> and the other people, PepsiCo rather, and the other um, partners within the new alliance and has very little um, to be, to kind of be talking about in terms of improving um, nutrition in Africa. And in fact, Oxfam has, has just um, left that partnership because they're now convinced that, that the, the new alliance is not really about nutrition, um, whereas they hope that it was. So anyway, so I think that that campaign that links um, what we're doing in the UK and, and, and uh, different money to that agenda over there, and also tries to link that to food sovereignty and global food sovereignty and agroecology networks, is, a, is, is kind of a move in the right direction. So that was a bit of a waffle on that one, I'm afraid. No, you, you got there, and what I wanted to know. Oh, thank you, And listening to you talk, I was getting the sense that you were not doing it about Mary Douglas, that uh, Tony Hamilton spoke to, but you were talking in language that was around in the 80s, which was that organizations have careers. Yes. The Soil Association is 60 years old. Yes. Uh, the Table House Farm, quite new. Uh, Fife Diet, seven years now, basically yes. six years. What was interesting was that I thought Fife Diet went yes. against the idea mm -hmm. that NGOs have careers. Yes. You could, the criticism to make Fife Diet <coughs> it was a great idea, and it was incorporated by the Scottish state. That's what the critics would say. Yes, but. And it was many to but. 
But the interesting, so the interesting story that I didn't tell about the thing is there's so many interesting stories that I would have loved to have told about all of these organisations. An interesting story about the five diet that I didn't tell um, is actually that I think it was earlier this year um, that the five diet made an announcement that it has decided that it will now cease to exist as um, a funded, uh, as a formally constituted organisation, uh, because it believed that funding. Um, and the kind of accountabilities and conditionalities attached to the funding that it had received from the Scottish Government had actually perverted it from its mission. Um, so that was part of it, but also because they felt that they, they realised through um, this intensive three years of experimenting with all of these different kinds of activities. I mean, that organisation was run by incredibly energetic people. Um, but they realised through all of that experimentation um, that actually they, there was a limit to what they could achieve um, without completely reforming and changing um, food policies in Scotland um, and the kind of more fundamental market structures. So they wanted to make um, a more political statement really. It was, I think it was almost a bit like a kind of whistle blowing, um, we're going to kind of exit the scene with a, with a bang. Um, so it was partly about generating you know, a bit of a splash and saying look, we could carry on, we, we were really successful, we could capture more funding, we could carry on doing what we're doing, but actually we don't think um, that it's getting us anywhere. We think, if anything, um, it's it's kind of creating greenwash. Um, I think, I'm really glad you told that story. By the way, the folk diet that Mike's more yes. under yes. is coming to speak at our symposium on ah, yes. So yeah. we have a great chance to spend a day with yeah. him. Um, it's a very interesting project, I agree with you. Uh, what is interesting about it for me is it's very rare you get an NGO that says it's closing itself. Yes. They do close, but they usually haven't chosen to close. Yes. This has chosen to close. Yeah. Well, actually, the kind of the subtlety is that it's not entirely. It's it's decided to close as what a funded, doing. constituted organisation, and, and as it was existing uh, for the last three years. And what it's now focusing on is kind of. Well, it, it kind of is talking about returning to its roots and becoming more a loose um, collection of consumers that are kind of linked more as a social movement and also in um, trying to do more of networking its local supply base in Scotland. So they're, they're setting one of the big projects that they have, and I'm not sure how this is funded or if it's funded, um, that they are now um, carrying out is to develop a kind of food co-op incubator. Um, so they're hoping to set up more consumer buying groups. But returning more to its original idea which was about getting consumers, um, increasing consumer demand in Fife um, to create the demand to support the supply base of local food suppliers across the county and, and, and then eventually across Scotland. Okay, this is getting, yeah. Um, I just wanted that once I get my question right. But, um, so, the civil society in general, how I perceive it, is at a macro level, overall, we're quite skeptical. Um, we see them as unreliable. That's what we need to tell them of us. Yeah, they are. Um, so, especially in relation to this feeding the world, what you're talking about, yeah. scaling up production. Okay, so even if in reality people have um, fantastic experiential knowledge, yeah. um, they're kind of deemed irrelevant. Um, so, if we could turn the situation around, would civil society have to be included at least increasingly? Okay, so what's a, that's a very good question. What's the role? Mm -hmm. Can civil society replace the state? Would be one version. I think that that's for me. That's the next big question. Is then, as I said, kind of how would that look in practice um, if policy wasn't so um, cynical? I think about civil society food initiatives and did decide to form a more constructive relationship. Um, and I think that, there, as I said, there are lots of things you need to think about. So how um, even in existing, um, so at the moment, the government does, through various different um, vehicles, provide some funding um, that civil society initiatives are able to um, capture. But um, so, so partly then thinking about how then the activities of those organizations are evaluated. I think that's the kind of starting point. 
um, and often they're evaluated by um, by way of very kind of generalized, um, centrally um, developed uh, uh, quantitative metrics. Um, I think that's problematic, um, and I'm not sure that I could I could uh, say that I have any kind of answer or, or whether this would be better. But an alternative would be to look at um, more kind of peer um, kind of uh, peer evaluation. So evaluation within networks of peers and, and looking at more kind of qualitative ways of trying to understand impact and influence. That's a bit of kind of micro answer to the question that looks at a very small part of it. But I think we then need to look more closely. Um, I think people aren't really thinking very much about how this would be done. So I think it would be good to be looking more closely at how um, policy might impact differently with civil society in a range of different ways. And that's just one of them. Do you want to come back? Not, not too, not too much. It's just that we, there's so, there's so much skepticism of people who don't have uh, scientific or academic. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't think the NGOs are doing that? NGOs have PhDs and academics go and work for NGOs? People who are working in this aren't necessarily who are digging the ground, the farmers, don't necessarily have the, and yes. I think that they have amazing experiential yes. knowledge. Yeah. And that picture that you showed right at the beginning isn't necessarily, the, the people on the green side aren't necessarily just academics, they're people who yeah. have thousands of years of experience of farming or yes. Inherited. Just my humble clarification. There are three sorts of science. There's the modeling science of economists and hydrologists and hydrology engineers. Certainly they're number of people. And there is the explanatory science, just about everyone in this one is in explanatory science. We guess and try to model and politics and start the model, so it's a tough business. Um, but then the third Sort of science is the exciting science, and that's activist science. In my career, it started in the modeling, but it doesn't really matter because society constructs, politics constructs, and that knowledge dominates, and all this big yeah. constructive knowledge always overwhelms the science of I'm being very provocative. Yeah. Um, but the, the most interesting science, which is in my later decades I've moved into, or like to think that I'm welcome in the domain, is like activist science. So you know, the, the people I need to come and build work with the city is a whole range of NGOs. I've got just as bright people as the scientists are in, in the academy. And they're doing a more important job because they're actually really seriously wanting to communicate rather than have the two and a half readers per or nearly unread stuff that people do in academic work. But you know, just finally, because I must stop, it, the farmers are a different category altogether in my view. They are wonderful and I can go on and on. They are disregarded, they have the wisdom. They, and, but <clears throat> I'm just, last year I was in Australia, I couldn't believe how anti-farmer the 95% of people who live in the cities of the South are. They're really anti-farmers. We're all ignorant about farming, but farmers are, for the most part, wonderful people. They're good science. Different forms of knowledge. Hannah, did you want to come in? This, I used to you. My question is more about Could you speak up, uh, yeah, the organisations themselves and how they reflect on your framework. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you gave them an opportunity to use it yeah. or how, from speaking to the people obviously you've um, categorised the kind of activities they're doing, yeah. but how much are they aware of where they're fitting in and you know, is that a strategic choice they're making? I'm sort of looking at evaluations and effectiveness and things like that, but a lot of that does come down to what the organisations think they're trying to achieve, and we can kind of take a step back and yeah. look at where, where <coughs> they think they're fitting. Well, in terms of my actual research and my fieldwork, I can provide a couple of um, answers in that um, I did ask all of the lovely people that I interviewed within who work within these organisations um, about what uh, so about what they think are the most effective ways of driving change towards sustainability. Um, and the kinds of answers that they came up independently of um, seeing my framework um, really did very much chime with that. Um, 
they were not framed in exactly the same way, but um, I think off the top of my head, um, they were about um, influencing um, government, central government policy. Um, they were about um, demonstrating um, through beacon mm -hmm. projects. Um, they were about um, uh, awareness raising and education, so kind of behaviour change. Um, and they were about um, working, uh, working in multi-stakeholder platforms with industry. Um, yeah, I can't remember. I, I did a kind of thematic analysis anyway, independently of that, of these kinds of responses, and found that they chimed quite closely with the roles um, that I'd come up with. But then I did also then confront some of them with the framework, and you know, and I think it's like with any kind of provocative. I mean, it's in th it, the framework's intended primarily to be provocative as a kind of heuristic. It's not. <coughs> it's not supposed to be. Um, you know, this is this is the way things really are and that's the end of it, you know, and it definitely can't claim to being exhaustive because that's not how I set up the research. Um, so I'm, you know, open to obviously acknowledging that there may be all sorts of other roles, but this is just one way of thinking about it. But so, so, so basically some of them found this really interesting um, and, and, and kind of immediately, oh, this is the kind of thing we need, we can use this, we can put this on our wall. Um, and others were kind of, no, oh, I don't really see it that way, I see it more through another analogy. Um, so, and then I guess a kind of final answer to that question is more to what extent are the organisations themselves strategic and reflexive and um, is this a kind of highly intentional um, process of thinking about the, the drivers for change. And I think um, that I looked at a range of different organisations from very local things like uh, a, you know, unincorporated transition food group on one end of the spectrum to um, WWF and the Marine Stewardship Council and things on the other end of the spectrum. Um, so I think there was a real range within that. And there were some people who I talked to who I felt that I could have I could have talked for weeks and continued to learn more and more about how you might possibly position yourself within um, debates and how you might possibly generate pressure on policy or how you might harness the grassroots and things. So I think that there is a huge amount of very strategic um, insight going on. And then also, on the other hand, um, one of my favourite um, meetings throughout my research was with um, Jeanette Longfield, um, the ex-coordinator of Sustain, um, who I asked about strategies. She said, oh, I hate strategies. I tell you what, I would rather pull my fingernails out than write another bloody strategy. And who, so who really attacked the whole idea um, of, uh, of kind of carefully planning and plotting thinking about where might the organisation be and where might we all be in 10 years' time. But I think that that comes from actually having a huge amount of tacit knowledge and being a very confident and clear-thinking person. So I think that, that that's fine for Jeanette. <laughs> and I think some of us prefer to sit down and muddle it through because we might not be quite so clear as she is. Can I just ask yeah, a question? Um, specifically with the soil association, you yeah. mentioned about how they've kind of Mm. I just wondered if you was if you got any feeling for why that was was that responding to that strategic decision yeah like that, how why did that happen I think a mixture and I think that um, again uh, Tim you talked about the, the kind of lives the, the life of organisation um, that that when when thinking about the life of an organisation um, that there's always uh, some, I mean, some of that's about responding to external developments. Some of that's about responding to internal developments. And then some of both of those things uh, is to some degree intentional and strategic. And probably the majority of it um, is ad hoc and post-rationalized. But you know, that, that's, I don't know to what extent I can claim um, to talk from you know, research um, in saying that. I think that's more my kind of personal feeling. Um, about these kinds of things, um, but I think in hearing, so I think the thing is, whenever you whenever you try and do to kind of write history of an organisation, you, you know you, you kind of weigh up all different possible stories, and I heard lots of different people's stories about the history of the Soil Association, and then sift from it something that's <coughs> interesting, um, and so I guess I, I guess I guess I would probably say. Um, 
I mean, do they know they've gone, that, would they be able to pinpoint that they've gone through those changes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think some of them um, would tell a similar story to that. And that's, uh, that's partly because they themselves um, have absorbed the stories that have been told by other people about them. So there are actually books out there about the History of the Soil Association, not just one, but a few. And there are lots of academic papers um, about the Soil Association. Um, so, yeah, so I think there's actually a whole field of different people thinking about this and sharing stories and sifting out the, the different stories. But yeah, so I, but I think that there is value anyway in like in having that retrospection and in sifting through all the stories and deciding which story is most empowering and which story helps you then see kind of where to move to next. If you see what I mean. Can I throw in a supplement to handle? Um, I thought Hannah might ask, and I thought she was edging into something that uh, both she and I are very interested in. In, in public health, where Hannah comes from, uh, and me partly, uh, one talks about impact. What difference have you made to a society of public health for all? How many bodies have you fed? How many days lost have you prevented being lost? You know, yeah. metrics, what Tony was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, what you were saying was the model and the, the role of NGOs in food, through your research, is actually just a social innovation role. Yeah. It's, um, it's a, a soft role, and that's what it is. Yeah. It's, you said 700 million pounds being spent, but you know, that's a lot of money compared to 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. But it's nothing mm. compared to out of the 100, 200 billion spent yeah. per year by the British on consuming food. So there's a, a very interesting difference about metrics. Yeah. Uh, are you edging? the discussion about NGOs' roles into social metrics as opposed to hard metrics. Is that the way your thinking is going? I guess, I guess what I'm saying is that if we're going to appreciate and harness this role that um, these civil society organisations have been playing in the past in terms of innovating, so this social innovation role, um, then uh, these kind of very much outcome-based metrics don't cut it. They don't, they, they, they kind of, um, they're looking at the wrong things, you know, trying to count the amount of food that's produced or the bodies that showed up on a particular day doesn't really get to um, the, more, more the kind of collective learning processes um, that have been gone through um, in order to, uh, to kind of, first experiment with, so, so the knowledge produced by all of this experimentation, and then the kind of translation, um, and then all of the kind of trading off and positioning um, and relating um, of um, these social innovations to incumbent systems, and, and the kind of negotiations that are involved then in terms of challenging norms and thinking, rethinking um, about our ideas, our worldviews, um, how, how we kind of see and perceive ourselves within food systems. This just simply can't be counted um, in a systematic way, I think, um, in, in the same kinds of way, uh, ways that you can, you can use more outcome-based metrics um, once, you're, once you're looking at um, a, a kind of standard and agreed set of outcomes that you want to achieve. But when you're actually thinking about how do we move um, from what we know to an entirely different system, well, you don't know what you're measuring. You see what I mean? So you can't rely on outcome-based measures. So that's when I think, um, in order to support and understand um, processes of social innovation, it's perhaps more appropriate to think about um, <coughs> yeah, ways of evaluation that are more about, um, I, guess ac I guess activist science would be more applicable. So engaging directly um, with uh, different civil society organizations, getting them to think collectively providing collective spaces um, to think about um, and develop new ways um, of, of going through collective learning processes um, and, and, and trying to sift through and connect um, the, different, the different themes and the different solutions um, that can then potentially be brought to scale um, and to influence mainstream systems in the way um, that some of these organisations have recently made a really big impact um, in institutional food. 
um, and in also in bringing um, organic and more sustainable um, forms of food production, not yet um, to the <coughs> 99%, but to a, a much larger number of people um, than was the case um, in you know, 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years ago. Great, good. Uh, I, um, I'm going to come back actually on a question that we both discussed about stories, and just to agree with you talking about actually the third sector organisation I work for, before we don't want to be in history, you know, 20,000.
posted that will support further sexual activity that have particular desires and particular <coughs> have a particular interest in the environment, for example, yeah. then will push through programs of work or that you know people can get involved with. Yeah, definitely. And I think whoever is the minister of the environment at the time, you know, makes a big difference around how or the kinds of opportunities um, and you know, some of Owen Patterson's comments recently about <laughs> yeah. uh, True. And then also on the other hand, you can see clearly where you've got a very um, amenable, again amenable, but but a very kind of supportive um, local politician. And um, for instance, where I'm from down in, in Lewis and, and Brighton and Hove, um, we've we've got Norman Baker in Lewis and we've got Caroline Lucas in Brighton, and so we've had a really big kind of local revolution in um, transport and sustainable mobility. Um, and this has kind of just come about as a consequence of the green majority in the local uh, government, Caroline being elected, and Norman Baker being a transport secretary and being able to kind of go, yes, I'll do that, and you can do that, <laughs> and so on. So I think it makes a big difference, yeah. Uh, well, just to chime in on that one, I think that it's just important to remember that organizations are also collective of individuals and who is in charge of different, different departments or different sectors. That also influences a lot, and especially so thinking about the example you gave on the soil association, how it changed yeah. over its life. And I think part of it is a strategic decision because someone saw an opportunity there, but also a lot of that is informed because of one. When you're a very small organization, you tend to be defined by the strengths of the people you have there, and that yeah. shows you the way at first. When you start growing, you can make choices on where to grow and where which departments to expand their whatnot, and that will be informed by the preferences of people and the holes that you had before, and, and that organic process yes. informs the decision. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think I, I'm kind of new to the whole civil society arena, and seeing it from inside, I had a completely different uh, idea from it before. But more or less like you were talking about that, okay, about how a lot of times civil society organizations have people that in there that they are, my thought previously was that they are not experts in any issue, so why should we listen to them? Uh, working with them for a while, I realized that a lot of the time, of course there is the issue of a lot of the time, they do have a lot of expertise, although they haven't done formal research or formal studies, but also a lot of the times, it's important to have people to ask the questions and not only to provide the answers. And a lot of the work that I see the civil society does is to inform academics or people in civil society who are actually doing research where that the that future world need to be. Yeah. I think examples like the food research collaboration and all those sorts of efforts that are happening more and more and more are great to bring together the people who have the questions and the people who may provide the answers. I think that's part of the or, or to use Tony Allen's view, different versions of science yeah, yeah. lining up is yes. what I thought you were saying. Yeah, no, no, of course. It, but it, I think it's just two things. One is evaluating the different knowledge streams of different sciences, yeah. but also getting together the. <coughs> so, civil society organizations also act as an amplifier of. Civil society concerns, and I think that they provide a good thing yeah. for that. Yeah, and I, well, I think also, um, the, again, the WDM that I mentioned is an example, I think, of where the kind of investigative journalism type side of what civil society organizations are able to do often then puts them ahead of the curve of academics who have, Absolutely. you know, much longer time scales. And, and I mean, you know. We sometimes, well, I, I, I'm new in this game actually, um, and, and I came from working originally in industry um, and then in civil society, and, and now I'm in academia. And you know, things, things change at, at, a, at a very slow pace, and, and, and work, you know, we take time over our work. And so it means that we're often actually really quite behind the curve. Well, that's 
extreme thing that's Coca Cola. Mm -hmm. Previously got um, Coke Zero and then Diet Coke. Yes. And I asked the CSR, that person who was a really sharp, wonderful person, to go to the landscape. You have to be breathtaking, you have to be an expensive person, and just yeah. other people, but there are whole department of people keeping a principle from the And why did they bring out diet first and then? But she said she thought of it. It was every time she paused, and all the other things so really the NGOs. So the NGOs often win like each other. So you think that in addition yeah. to doing all the, the stuff, they also deliver like each other. Yes, they do. Absolutely. Well the, the example uh, <coughs> the example of uh, life, which is a stevia based sweet. It's partly in response to public health and years of public health criticism about soft drinks and sugar and chemicals. <coughs> and they've been quietly panicking, actually. And that there is an example. Of this. And it's starting. Is it have a starting? No, it doesn't. Uh, I shouldn't say that's so categorical. I don't think so. Uh, no, I don't think the life does. Life does. It's a steamy Yeah, diet. Diet is ego, which is steamy, which is a plant. But the point is, back is about you, maybe this is a painful point. What, what we've got and what you, your talk has beautifully done for us is remind us, you know, you started with the, the triangle, yes. um, which actually goes back to Alaska. Yes. It's Alaska's political science from the 30s. You're taught by the mother of the NRC, can you believe? Yes. Um, or she believe? Uh, uh, what we've got is actually a more, more complicated world where it's not a sort of top-down government. Mm -hmm. You've been dealing with a world where NGOs or CSOs, mm -hmm. as you've been describing them, uh, see themselves as change agents. They want a different food system. Yeah. Yeah. But the question that I've got for you now is, I'm also thinking of some CSOs, very big CSOs, which don't necessarily want a very different food system. Yeah. They want your niche argument applies maybe to some very big organization. Yeah. They're actually very comfortable with how things are and their business is to retain things how they are. Yes. Because they've got a slice of the action. Yes. Does that fit what you thought was some of Yeah. I think well I think what it does is remind um, remind me, remind me when I'm talking about this and, and us collectively, um, that it's, it's easy to kind of look at this kind of model and think, oh, well, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bottom up and there's a top down, and civil society is all about the grassroots and rising up, and then, you know, and the state and the market are all this kind of top down stuff, um, which actually is incredibly um, st stupid um, and, and oversimplified. Yeah, because obviously there's all sorts of, of things like. Um, class and gender and, uh, and nationality and, and all sorts of characteristics of individuals and of organizations that cut right across all of that, which mean that um, very um, very aristocratic people can have one foot um, in, in government and another foot in, in civil society and can seamlessly walk between the corridors of, you know, from the corridors of power to the grassroots um, and have all of their interests kind of tangled up um, there as well. Um, so I, I think I think that's part of it. Um, I, I feel like I lost slightly what was the. Well, I, I suppose what I was no, you're answering it actually. Yeah. I, what I was interested in was essentially there's a spectrum of civil yes, society. Yes, right. Yes. And secondly, yes. there are different role models of what sort of civil society you can be. Yes. I mean, your four models were provocatively trying yes. to say here they are, but yes. you said earlier there's much more than that. Yes. Uh, I, I suppose I was, this is a big conversation, yeah. we can't have it, but I was thinking this long history that we have in Britain of civil society, yes. the National Trust, you know, yes. the Royal Society yes. Protection of Birds, the yes. RSPCA, the British Health Fund, the RSPCA founded 200 years ago that created the National Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children. Yes. It started with animals first, yes. and then children. Yes. And children isn't a role, the birds, so the animals is a role. You know, there's some very interesting, yes. quirky things about Britain and the food-related 
civil society world. Yes. And I think what you've given us is a, a lovely insight into sort of the radical way. Yes. The yes. ones that are already committed to a sustainable food system. Yes. And my question, which I don't want you to answer, is do you think you're in, well, you can answer uh, do you think your insights into that radical wing, mm. some of which is 60 years old, might be sort of association with yeah. water, do you, think, do you think they're different in food to, say, other areas? Oh, yeah. No, well, I, I, I mean, I, I don't, like, I can't answer that empirically and say, no, no. they're not. Um, but I, I think I'd like to know if they are. So, um, and I, 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 I don't know, I wonder, I wonder. I think that but I'm not sure that there's any reason why they shouldn't be. They might look subtly different, but I think that the kind of underlying theory that that framework's based upon is really kind of can describe any um, type of, of large-scale societal change process uh, that maybe, let's say, is in the region of 50 to 100 years. I mean, it's not, the, the kind of X axis on the diagram is not meant to be tied in a linear sense. It's about transformation, but it could, it could equally apply to health and social care or animal welfare or any other number of, of kind of um, change processes. But I think the, the, the other thing that you highlighted, um, which, is, which is really important, is to acknowledge that civil society organisations can also resist change and be interested in reinforcing established patterns. Um, as, as equally as they, as they might be interested in changing them. So that model um, was about describing um, the roles in transition. So what kinds of roles do organisations play when they want to change things? Um, and also it's a bit of a kind of, there's, there's a little bit of an assumption of, of, of them um, coming from the outside. So it's a, it's a model about um, outsiders wanting to change a system rather than um, insiders of, of that system wanting to resist changes or wanting to control change from, from the inside, if you see what I mean, in which case they might adopt different kinds of strategies. That's actually a very interesting example. We really do need to stop. But I had the privilege of knowing Peter Roberts, who founded Compassion World Farming 14 years ago, at the end of his life. He was a farmer yes. who decided to change animal world. That actually, that transition is, I think, more common than we think yes. in terms of motivating the creation of yes. food organisations. Actually, it's something. There's something about food and civil society that's very personal. Yes. It's both social, and societal, and also very personal. Yes. Very emotional. Too. Very much. E emotional. So exactly. I think, yeah. I think Rachel, is, this has been very useful, and it's a conversation I'm sure we could carry on forever, but we'll stop it. But I think we should thank Rachel very much. A very thoughtful bit of research and uh, very interesting tales told and lots of interesting mm. tensions that you've brought up that are uh, true to all of us. I think anyone who knows what's going on in the world. So very good. Well, thank thank you. you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.